All right, good morning, and uh, I guess Happy New Year. Starting out another year, and uh, we have our first Tech Tuesday of the year. And uh, <clears throat> this month we are doing it on Phoenix Contacts uh, Niagara, they call it the Niagara Inline Controller, their ILC 2050BI is their Niagara Jace. We're all familiar with the commercial grade hardware with the FX80s, the, the Jace 8000s, the 600s, 300s, and all those. And, um, and uh, Phoenix Contact came out with their ILC 2050, which is built on industrial hardware, industrial grade hardware. It's all the same software, it's Niagara, it's, it really is a Jace, but uh, they have their, their own hardware. And if we just look at the Jace itself, uh, on the right there, that is actually the, the Jace. Um, it has four configurable Ethernet ports. Uh, it actually has two NIC cards in it, and you can configure it to have uh, all four be on the same switch, basically. You can have one by itself and three together as a switch, or you can do two and two. You can do, uh, we'll get, I think we have another slide on here, but uh, it'll be able to do uh, loops as well. So it's got that built in, the protocols for that. Um, there are two RS-45 serial ports on there. That's the uh, first, the green uh, card that's on there. There's two RS-485 ports there. Uh, there's a mini USB. That we'll get into that's used for getting into uh, a shell and it has a standard USB 2.0 uh, port as well uh, and one of the um, unique things about the ILC uh, and they again it's their inline controller they have their inline bus of IO modules and you can actually have up to 63 IO modules connected to this piece of hardware they also have a LAN version of this Jace. So if you had a job you needed a LAN, there's a special part number for their ILC, which was just a uh, dash L, um, and that actually then would come with a uh, neuron chip built in the LAN part of it built into it. There is no add-on card to add LAN to a standard ILC. I'll just give you a quick view of a, a, well, it's not loaded, it doesn't have 63 cards on it, but here's a uh, representation of the JACE or their, their ILC 2050 with I.O. modules. And you'll see there, there's a power module, the black one there is part of the JACE, and everything to the right of that is I.O. So it could be a plant controller. There's strain relief, that's what these uh, extended pieces are here. Um, they've got spots where you can put in tags and markers for you know tagging each of these uh, cards. Um, there are <clears throat> LEDs on the cards for statuses, and they're all spring cage terminals uh, for easy uh, wiring. And as you can see, everything is uh, DIN rail mounted. And realistically, the size of a regular Jace. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, it's about six modules. So if we looked, one, two, three, four, five, six. So this module here to the left is basically the size of an 8,000. So within that range, you've got four, well, let's say eight, 16, roughly 20 to 30 points of I.O. in that small footprint. And it depends on I.O. cards, because some have I.O. cards have two points, others have four, some have eight, depending on the, uh, the I.O. And it doesn't matter what position they're in? That's correct. Yeah, I just got a new uh, RTD card in yesterday, and I just stuck it at the end, and it just added it at the next address available in that line. Cool. Here's a typical setup, and this actually is pretty close. It's one module shy I have set up here on our panel. <clears throat> but as you'll see in the lower right corner, limited lifetime warranty. As long as you... When you use an ILC 2050, as long as you use their power supply and their surge protector with their ILC controller, you have a limited lifetime warranty on the product, which is not something you'll see we have with, with any other vendor out there with uh, Niagara product. 
So it's definitely a differentiator there. And, and, and built on industrial hardware is why they're able to do that. Because most of their products, if not all their products, have a limited lifetime warranty. As long as you follow their requirements of, like I said, surge protector, power supply. So if you look at what's here, you have the ILC 2050 BI, so it's in the black module to the left. And then from there, there's um, digital input, digital output, a 10K thermistor uh, on this one here, um, voltage input, analog input uh, on two, the two more of those, and what else do they have on there? It's like another RTD. But you can see how you set this up. And again, they just plug into the, the, the module to the left. And they actually, there's a tab across the top. You actually push down that tab and pull. You actually take the terminal part of this off the main, off the board. So if you had to replace any hardware, you wouldn't have to do any unwiring to do that. You could just pop that piece off to get behind it to be able to replace any of the uh, hardware that's in there, if there was ever a need to do that. Supports the protocols that we're used to uh, adjacent supporting. Um, <clears throat> they also have, as part of theirs, DALI, the MP bus, the BLEMO M bus, their IO driver is for their inline IO. And then K and X IP is another driver that's part of their uh, their product line. But all the standard, you know, out of the box, you have BACnet and Modbus. Obviously, line you have to buy the special line, Jace to to, to get that. <coughs> and the serial interfaces, as I said, it comes with uh, two built-in 485s, and you can see on this diagram here how the wiring works. So you have COM1 on 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 and the shield on 1.3. If you had LAN, you'd be down here on 1.4 and 2.4 for the terminals for that. And if you have, if it's a BACnet job, the only RS-45 ports that support BACnet are the built-in ones. You can add, and use this next section here, you can add a 485 card to this but it does not support BACnet. So it'll be Modbus or any of those other drivers that I had shown. So for whatever reason, I'm not sure why, uh, you'd have to use those first two ports. Now, if you needed more than that, you would just go with the BACnet IP router and bring them in BACnet IP to get around that. So that's not that big of a deal. No cost, that's all. Yeah. But you also would have had costs with adding another 485 card. Sure. So I don't know what the cost differences are. My guess is they're probably pretty close in price. And that's just, you know, that's just off the wall guess. I don't know. I don't have the pricing in front of me, unfortunately. Any questions so far? I take that to be no. Then we move on to the inline I.O the I.O. modules that uh, you can plug in. You can see the, the side view of it, and you can see the, uh, the connectors, the, the copper spots or brass, whatever they are, they, on the side there that'll make connection when you plug them in together. And then you'll see some of the wiring details here. But they have uh, the different models are digital input, they have relays, uh, digital outputs, triacs, analog input, analog outputs, uh, then they have some functional terminals. So if you have you're using Dolly Lighting, they have a, a card specifically for that. Then they have other cards for power and segment clamps for having you know to secure the wires. Um, and also, if you needed to uh, have added power, if you have you know active sensors, you need to put that power and you can add it to that inline I/O. And here's a list of the uh, just it's a it's an eye chart. But basically, uh, there's two different types. Well, there's really four different types of digital inputs. But you'll see they have some that actually will take 120 to 230 volt. So it is all in their industrial. So they're taking a lot of these I.O. cards or what they're using in their PLC product as well. You'll see they have <clears throat> analog input cards, temperature input cards, and in the, in the industrial world, RTDs are the standard sensors. 
So you'll notice they have the RTD, uh, RTD cards. And then they have one card here that's a uh, four input, zero to 10 volt, and RTD can be configured. That one actually can do zero to 300 ohms, or 300,000 ohms. So you're able to configure that to do your 10K, your 20K, and you know other standard BAS sensors that we're used to using. Like these other RTD cards are um, for PT1000, PT100 type sensors. So they're lower, lower um, resistance range. The precision on these is much higher than a than they are in the standard uh, cases, really in standard controllers too that we're used to working with. Anything I didn't put on the slide, I should add to it is what the uh, I think it's 16-bit or the uh, from the I/O. I have to verify that, and I can I can do that. So there's a large range of of cards that you can add to it. And if we move back onto the the uh, main part of the ILC and get in more into the software end of things, they have a mini USB port. You know, we're used to working with the mic with the micro USB on the 8000s, and what they've adopted is the uh, the mini plug. And from there, you can get to the shell mode, and it's all done through uh, Telnet, so it's IP based basically. So when you plug into that, you're going to be set with an IP address, and you go in the shell like you normally would with an 8000 using PuTTY, and it would come up with the menu, and I've, my Jace will we'll get into that, and I'll show it to you live. But from there, you can get to the shell mode, you can get to the overview of the licensing controller hardware, network configuration, so you actually can go in there and change that, those four ports. You may want to say one dedicated port and three go together. You can change that there. You want to do uh, MRP, all right, MRP loop, mm, uh, rapid spanning tree. Rapid spanning tree um, through here. You can set that up using the uh, through their shell. Date and time configuration. You actually can go in with the browser through this port, and you can actually uh, check out your I/O without even putting a station in this case. So they use the rapid spanning, not the industrial like Johnson. Correct. Right. Interesting. Well, that's a special router that's or really? switch that's required to do that. You have to build a special switch in yeah. here to do that, and yeah, that, that's I think more costly. Yeah. And then one of the big um, features of of this ILC is when you're in that shell connection there on that debug port. If you use a browser, you can go in and look at your uh, I/O, and you can actually command your output. So you can test all your I/O before you even put a station in the, into the uh, into this uh, JACE. Sounds like the shell mode's much, much more. Yeah, there's a lot more that, yeah, it does a hell of a lot more. When you plug into that port, it becomes 172.16.0.10 is what your your connection's going to be when you go to into uh, PuTTY to set that up to connect to it. And then from there, you can see you can update your time, your IP, obviously your IP address settings, your switch configuration, so you can, you know, ring monitoring, RSTP, um, assigning of the uh, ports. You can enable and disable the uh, Sedona or Niagara part of the uh, of the controller. <coughs> the I/O server that's in there gives you access to that. So if you had to change ports to be non-standard, you could change them there, and it gives you the uh, what the standard uh, username and password is when you're factory defaults, and you can reboot the controller. And actually, if we want, we can just jump I'll jump over to that uh, putty. So this is actually the uh, the ILC that I've got on my board, and I when I first powered up my PC this morning, I just plugged into it, so the, the, the ILC's been up and running. So this is first uh, came up, and Sysmic was the, I guess, is the manufacturer that, that worked with IELTS with um, they bought the Phoenix Contact. Oh, they bought Sysmic. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And then this is the uh, the main menu of their shell. And you'll see just like standard shell that we're used to, it gives you your host ID and, you know, versions of software, what your IP addresses are. Um, but one of the things that's nice in here, you can go in and say, I want to do switch configuration. And right now, you can see it's set up that 
Ethernet 0 is LAN 4 and 3, Ethernet 1 is LAN 2 and 1. And I can actually go in there and select what do I want. So I want Ethernet 0 to be all four. So I want to do one on Ethernet 1 and three on 0, two and two, one on 0, three on 1. So it gives you that ability to uh, make those changes right from here. And then here, if you want to do spanning tree protocol, you could set that up as well. Then if we move across and look at the browser side of that debug port, I uh, get a few screenshots of, of uh, what you see in there, uh, but you're hitting it with uh, 172.16.0.10, and it's uh, port 8080 is the port that you uh, are going to hit with the browser to gain access. So right off the bat, when you log in, you can look at your uh, host ID and software version. Uh, then you got the information view that gives you software versions and license information. Network configuration, so just like you would, you know, so instead of having to go into platform and go into, you know, using shell with PuTTY, right from the browser, you can go in there and change your IP addresses. You want to change the web server, or you can change that from there as well, date and time. It gives you a different view of the switch setup than what's in the uh, in the shell mode, but <clears throat> it allows you to uh, configure it as well from from here. You can see the default configuration is Ethernet zero is LAN three and four, which are the bottom two um, Ethernet ports, and then Ethernet one, the secondary Ethernet port is LAN one and two, and the ring management is disabled out of the box. And then the one really nice feature if you're going to be using their I.O. is their terminals view. You actually get live values and status on your cards, and you can override your outputs, test your relays, stroke the valves, whatever it might be. So if we go back and go over here, so this is that uh, 172.16.0.10, port 8080. So right away, log, you know, jumping on, you're at this main screen here. Um, from there, I can go in and look at versions. I can look at licenses or at the license that's in there. And then there's some offline functions to set up Dolly or MP bus if you're working with that. <clears throat> and then if you want to go in further and look at things, we just hit the login. And you notice I didn't save a password or anything. You just get access to it. So their assumption is, I guess, if you're plugged into the front of it, you should be able to you have access to it so you can go in there and look at it. So now that we're logged in, you can see at the top we're running 480.110. I was told last week they haven't released 4.8, yet it's on their website, so I figured I might as well run it. We can go in and look at the networks, network overview, set up your Interface 1, Interface 2, so your you know, primary and secondary Ethernet 0, Ethernet 1. Set up your IP addresses. Server, if you wanted to change that, you could. Date and time. The I.O. server, part of it. And if you have it enabled to run. And then the switch setup, you can come in here and set it up various fashions. <coughs> then the next one is terminals. And this is actually a live look at my, uh, the board that we have here. And you'll see we've got a card with, uh, it's got two RTD inputs, a card with eight digital inputs, four analog outputs, eight digital outputs two digital outs, and four resistive inputs. And actually, you can set up your configuration from here, too, if you wanted to. 
like I know I'm using the, the zero to 300,000. So it gives you what that range is there, or what the reading is. And over here I've got this one set up as a um, an RTD, a PT-1000. And actually what I put on there was just a, uh, a potentiometer to get in the range of a PT-1000 just to show it if you were using the standard RTD sensors, it gives you the raw, their actual temperature rather than the resistance. My digital outputs, I can actually come in here and say turn on and off. Auto. Like I can on the uh, this card here, you can look. You won't be able to hear it on there, but you can hear the relays clicking on and off. Your analog outputs, you just go in and set to whatever voltage you want. And when you're done, you just click on auto, and it takes it back. See on the left side, it shows you each of the cards. I'm not sure if that doesn't bring up anything clicking on it. It just takes you to it. Okay. So it's a quick way to see that one, your cards are functioning, and two, that you actually have uh, your inputs and outputs working. And again, this is without even going in and working with a uh, with workbench. Questions on that part? Okay. Can I ask a question about the uh, temperatures? Out of the box, what does it want to use as a temperature? Is it unconfigured? Is it well? There, you have to when you bring them in. You tell it. You have to select what you want. I mean, I, I see that you can use um, RTDs or you can use thermistor types, right? Depending on which card you buy. But does it like you know for webs it wants to be a 20k for for uh, RIO it wants to be 10k. Yeah. Does this thing have a particular just RTD? Their standard is an R standard RTD like PT100, PT1000 type thing. Gotcha. Yeah. And then I grabbed a part out of one of their manuals to show, they can see on the right side, the um, every card has a set of um, status LEDs. And you'll see I've just added some on here. Like, so this is actually just for the JACE itself. So you'll see there's, there's COM 1 and 2 LEDs, and then on the JACE itself, rather than what's a JACE normally have, it has uh, what? Uh, Heartbeat. Heartbeat and power, right, or status, or whatever that other one is. This one you'll see actually has nine LEDs as part of it. So you have uh, the communication LEDs, obviously, are at 485. The service LED, which is the SV in the bottom right on the uh, the black card, um, tells you what's what's actually happening. You know, is it normal operation? You know, is it is it booting? So it's an easy way just to quickly look at your to look at your um, chase to see what's happening in there. You know, you get a nice setup of a nice view of the um, the process status LEDs. So it's the status of the Niagara platform. You can see is it has it not started? Is it running? Is it, and then it tells you if it's running and more than 50% of the processor time is being used for it, between 10 and 50, less than 10. So it is really a good quick way of seeing their true health of the, uh, of the JACE. Then you have a status of the Niagara application itself, status of the I.O. server for your I.O. cards, and then your standard, um, and then also then they have some uh, uh, LEDs for, uh, Notice, I guess, if the software is up to date or not. Oops. Then on the I.O. cards, <coughs> they'll tell you if the I.O. server is running 
or if they're running with no errors or with errors. So they've done a good job with, with status indication. And just uh, a little bit on their software. They call theirs Emolytics. I'm not sure how that came about, but that's the name of their, their workbench, if you want to call it that. There's some, they're like the way Johnson Controls used to do it, or, or Tritium Security. Their version number is independent of the version number of Niagara. So 1.1 it was uh, 4.7, and 1.2 is 4.8. So they, you know, it supports 4.8.110 with, with the 1.2. Um, you can install their workbench. It's about 3.2 gig for the install. Or you can add the uh, modules, the add-on modules and distribution files to your existing uh, workbench. I mean, you can work with their workbench and just copy in the, the license that you're using, depending on what brand you're using. You can manually copy your license over and you can use their full tool or you can use their, um, their set modules. Uh, they've got it set up on their website uh, where you can get the uh, full workbench or just the add-on modules. Well, the add-on modules part, they only have available for 4.7. The same basic set setup file in 4.8 actually installs in your existing workbench, but rebrands everything as analytics. So the look and feel is not the same anymore. And, and so what I did was I went in and mimicked what the modules were in the distribution files from 4.7 and made up my separate install zip file with all the files that you need to be able to work with. And they said once they're fully released with 4.8, they'll have a separate executable for installing the modules in your existing workbench. And what I'm doing right now, I'm just using their, their full workbench. <clears throat> and you can download this from uh, our BP Tech Center. I did uh, put that up there a couple weeks ago, so it's it's available there. Any questions on the overview of it? Anything at all? Hey, Frank. Anybody out there? Yes, sir. Hello. Yeah. Yeah, I noticed the uh, Sedona's popped up on that one of your slides. How does yeah. Sedona play into the whole um, system here? It's not something we're working with that I know of. I mean, I, I've not seen any information on it at all, to be totally honest. If I had to okay. guess, yeah, it's it, I heard it's it, my guess is it's probably used in some way for the I.O. cards. That's a good point. Behind that the might scenes. be. I will okay. definitely get an that, answer to that. I'll, I'll add it to that document. Yeah, I'll add. The, I'll, I'll get an answer to that, and I'll add it to this uh, that presentation when we put it up on uh, on BP Tech Center. Good question. <coughs> George has a price. Just get out of there and go right back to. Before I go on the workbench, anything else on uh, on the uh, debug port and their uh, browser interface? It's pretty slick. Okay. So then we'll go right over to. <laughs> This is their tool, and you'll see it looks a little bit different, different colors. It's their green. Um, I just have a station, a demo station that I made up. Um, oh shit, could you run and get my battery? With any luck, if Matthew moves fast enough, I won't lose my battery, I, and, and I won't lose my connection. Luckily, my office is only across the hall. Yeah, your battery's flashing there, buddy. Yeah, that was awful fast. Didn't give me much warning. He's got to figure out which. Oh, you got it. Okay. All right. Uh, 
Bear with us. Bear with us. So I guess as we're going, what kind of questions do you have? George, uh, do you have anything on pricing or anything like that? I, I have a general pricing, and it surprised me this morning. Um, compared to webs Good and that. FX, you ready? Yeah. Compared to, compared to webs and FX, it has the lowest list price. Um, really? At, yeah, That's at sixteen fifty five. So, but but remember, multipliers are different, right? So, um, but on the flip side, with a standard multiplier of an average of our customers, it's still less than a Honeywell Web's Jace. Um, but that doesn't include the power supply or anything else that you have to add to it. So keep that in mind. Um, you're looking around 765 for the base ILC, as they call it, their Jace. But then you have to think about their power supply and for the extended warranty, you're adding another $240 to that. All right. Um, a Honeywell Search Web Jace. Yes, correct. Surge suppression, power supply, and whatever the other thing is in there. The Honeywell Webs Jace comes out to 780, and an FX Jace is around 831. And the uh, a five device license from Honeywell and Phoenix is within. Well, they're the exact same price. The uh, initial maintenance agreement between. Honeywell and FX is $4 less for Phoenix. And, you know, Johnson just seems to run about 40% higher on the, the five-year maintenance agreement. It's running about 60 bucks more. And the initial license is about, you know, five bucks more. So it's not, you know, I don't think it, it's just that, that 240 bucks that puts you a little higher, but it gives you the lifetime warranty. Whereas Johnson has a three year, Honeywell has a one year. So it's definitely a good selling point for the customer. Great, okay. Everybody still see my screen? Yep. Okay, yep. good. So we didn't lose my, any of my connection. So just my laptop. And it seems to me if you purchase the the DC power supply and the surge suppression with the limited lifetime warranty, it's a small cost to pay, I think. You know, and, and it's it's right in line with the other guys. Plus you got these added features, I mean, that whole debug report and what you could do with that and the I.O. that's available. Absolutely. You know, being industrial grade, it's, you know, I think, especially if it's a critical application. You guys are gonna have to weigh, you know, which, which is which is better? I mean, it, there may be a little bit more, little bit more cost, but I think you get a lot more features and a lot more flexibility. Well, Certainly, the, a, the housing uh, and everything. Is the, uh, you know, you can write a spec around this ILC and, and keep people out. So that's another thought. All right, so back to where I was on workbench. As I said, we're running 4.8 on the Actually, the operating system looks like Linux running in this box. We go down to my station. Everything in here, no different than what we're used to working with with Niagara. The only difference is they have their, their own I.O. network. In my case here, these are the cards and these are the order in which they're connected to the ILC. So you say I got a uh, two temperature input, eight digital input, four analog out, eight digital out, two digital out, four analog in. So I get six, 14, 18, 26, 28 points in the space of, I've got an 800 or an 8,000 right below it and it's the same footprint as the uh, 8,000. 
Could you, could you put everything on a DIN rail, power it all up and run, you know, put a station in there and run discovery and it'll find all these things as well? <laughs> you go in and do discovery, it does find all those cards for you. Folks might like that better than the browser or the, you know. Yeah. Well, the browser, you're not setting up the station. The browser is strictly for right. checkout. For setting up the I.O. Right. Setting up the I.O. you're doing in the station. I thought you could do it in the browser. In the browsers to be able to put your view of how you're looking at the I.O. Just, and it, yeah, it just, it's, it's just the checkout. View, checkout. Right. Check out. right. Doesn't affect yeah. it. It's not, oh, it check has nothing. That's why I said it's independent of the station. It doesn't need to be a station installed in order to use that checkout part. No, those configurations were just how it displayed right. there on that. Oh, okay. I thought I thought you could configure all of the no. inputs and outputs. It's the same. And come in here and discover it, and would already be no. configured. I mean, it's the same um, selections. Like if I go in here on this I/O card, these choices are what came up. Sure. So this is where you asked about what are the standard. These are their standard ones down here. <coughs> so their standards are PT100, PT1000, and Nickel1000. And this is the only analog input card that does zero to 300,000. The others go up to about 3,000. Thus, if we're going to use our standard thermistors, we need the zero to 300,000. So what I did here is I got this first one. Uh, an easier way is if I go into the uh, AX property sheet, I set up a generic table for 10K type 3. And it's, you know, that's how I got my reading. Um, I have a Those tables are savable. You can, yeah, you can you can go in. I'll show that. Um, I got it. Go do this. Is a, a 20k NTC one that I created, and yeah, you can import and export the tables. So what we'll probably do is, <coughs> I need to put a small range of this of the curve just for playing around with it and understanding it better. But we can come up with a full range. Like I know I have a 20k NTC one I use for NDIO or NRIO. Um, that I bring in for 20K. One thing I did find, though, is this, for whatever reason, their tool requires the resistance to be um, lower. You have to start with the lowest resistance to the highest resistance. The normal chart is I'm starting out with a high resistance with the low temperature and working it that way, and it fails every time. So I found that I have to do it, the, the resistance in order of, you know, the, from lowest to highest value for it to work. So I can't just use my 20K one I had on an NDIO, so I'll, I'll create a new one. Now, in talking to Andres, the product manager for, for Phoenix Contact for this, when he sent me the this card that we can use with our standard thermistors, he said that there, with their software, you could select 10K Type 3, Type 2. And I don't see anywhere where it does that, so I have an email out to him to find out what am I missing. You know, but realistically, worst case, I mean, the, using that table works fine. So that's a, you know, that's a simple way of doing it if, if they don't really have that ability. Build, build before seven? I mean, it's a possibility. I just go back to look. Worry, yeah, maybe? It could be. I don't know. But the same thing, you know, you're just discovering your points and bring them in. The reason I say that is because our contractors are used to certain part numbers when they buy things, especially our webs guys or our FX guys. They're used to a certain, okay, I need a six-inch duct sensor. They know what that part number is in their yeah. head. Rather than retraining themselves to a whole new yeah. part number, they may want to use what they're used to and right. apply that's it. Why we're gonna, well, that's why you have the ability with that card to be able to do whatever resistance range you want, whatever type of semester. It's just the table has to be created, which is really not that big of a deal. Doing it for other products. Yeah, if we go okay, in, can we do that, it. Frank, and put it on Tech Center? Yeah, I started doing the 10K Type 3 and the 20K, but yeah, that'll be up there when I, when I get around to putting that one, uh, adding that. Yes. Yeah. Well, I'm going to hold off. Okay. I'm holding off until I get an answer back from Andres on whether or not they really do have software that allows you to pick those ranges. And it could very well be they really don't. They just have those tables, the XML files that we can import in there and use, like I'm creating here. I mean, if we go in and look at our digital output, you'll see that they, uh, uh, let's see. Here's 
seems to me that we have the ability to get them to do it, to add it to their list of sensors that you can select from. Right. It's just that's best case scenario, mm -hmm. I suppose. So here's their, you know, there's a digital output card here. Uh, actually, there's nothing, nothing at all different on that one. I thought maybe that they had a different setup. Let's see, like a digital input card on is off and off is on, and you can, you know. They're all scans. Really, it's just the, the inputs, the analog inputs that have, you know, where you would configure. Like if I go up here, this is a two input RTD. And so if I go into that uh, points, down here you get your choice, and I'm using PT1000. And it's interesting, they actually have <clears throat> sensors set up that are two wire, three wire, four wire. They actually even have a, a one wire sensor where only one wire gets connected to the uh, I.O. card. Um, I started investigating it to understand what that was. Really, there is a common still, but that common's coming in through the, uh, the ground, through the back plane and, and the power source for it. Standard setups are always going to be two wire for that. And I imagine the three and the four wire have to do more with also with, the, you know, on RTDs, I guess there's three wire sensors and you know, that kind of thing. I haven't really looked at any of the wiring yet. That's the other part, too. I'd like to have, so like Johnson Controls does a great job on every installation sheet for their controllers. They have that back section that has all the terminal wiring for every type of IO. On theirs, it's a little more confusing and it's, it's not real, it's not on any document that's that's clean and clear and has everything together. So that would be something that would make sense for us to, to put together to, to again put out on the on to <coughs> BP Tech Center. And also since I these are the only only modules that I have plugged into our card or into our um, ILC controller, I could actually come in here and pick any one of the other cards that they have available. You see they got quite a few. Now, the economy ones are, the eco ones are, are I think a lower cost because they're, then they're specific, like this is just a standard zero to 10 volt card, I think it is. And they have less precision. Yeah. Right. That's right. That was the other piece. Yeah, thank you. Know, but their precision, the but their precision is still better, I think, than a uh, NRIO. Yeah. Not even good. at the lower end. And you can still discover them offline and bring the points in. Obviously, it's in fault because we don't have it connected. But so it's still standard tools for bringing the uh, the IO in. So it's. Simple, really nothing new to, to learn. <laughs> I think the biggest thing was just understanding how their uh, their shell mode works. The other thing I found on their shell mode, or when you go in through um, uh, through Putty, I don't see. Well, you know, we're used to seeing the um, the shell where we're seeing it stream all of the the background, whatever it's called, commands and things messaging and um, that's not part of what that shell does for them. Now we haven't had any need to do any troubleshooting with them, but I imagine there's got to be a way if something goes wrong with this, to be able to put it in the mode to be able to see that. So they may have a debug mode that you got to turn on someplace that then would stream that data out in there. But uh, sure. yeah, I'll add that to my list of things to look into. I'm trying to think of what other, that's pretty much everything on the, uh, 
on the cards. Oh, the other thing was the on that inline I.O. bus or cards, they actually have a remote one. Actually, if I go back here, I had it on the slide, but they didn't really point it out. They have a remote I.O., so no, nobody even asked the question. Jack, I expected you to have asked that question. What if you had remote and you need a remote I.O.? Um, they have a remote I.O. It's Modbus TCP is what the communications is coming back. But you can have remote I.O. and just use Ethernet connection back to, uh, to the ILC and bring those points in the same way you would if they were directly plugged in. Yeah. And that's internal to the ILC. You don't have to program it for Modbus or anything. Is that correct? But uh, I imagine why well, you would you would have to have some. So yeah, you'd have to have the Modbus in there. I would think to do it. But otherwise, that's not set up. That there's already a, there's already a driver built in for that remote I/O that'll bring the points in automatically. Okay, maybe there, there might be. I'd have to. I don't have one to play with, so I haven't really looked into that part of it. But I can. Write that. I'll look into. It. I'll write that down. Thank you, George. But it does give you. Like, the main thing is it, it gives you the ability to do that remote functionality if, if there's a need. Yes, distributed I/O or whatever. Right. <clears throat> and still use the, the same I/O box. Right. <clears throat> Not especially. Yep. Um, anything else you guys can think of that we need to nope. touch on? George, have you got anything? Nope. Uh, we're not stocking them as of yet, but they're in stock in Harrisburg, PA, so they're a day away. They do have a demo board that has what Frank has with power supply and stuff to loan out. They expect it back in a couple weeks, so if anybody would like to play with it, let me know. We'll take care of it. And I know two years ago or so, I think when we first met with Phoenix Contact, and the one thing that that um, was mentioned that it, it starts up much faster because it's an industrial jace. I just want to uh, make sure you all don't think that that's the case. That that because it's industrial, it's going to be a faster boot. It's still like an 8,000. You're still like three to five minute boot time to get it up and running. So that part's still there. Now, with the whole product line of of the uh, of Phoenix Contact, you have uh, it doesn't show here, but they have a whole line, and we've gone through that I guess last month with the, the networking and patent switches and power and all that. Uh, they have their own inline uh, UPS that can be used too. So there's a like that power supply that's shown there, that Uno power. Um, they have a um, UPS card and then a little battery pack that goes in line just like that does. Right. It's all you guys got to remember. It's all DC, so your your actuators and devices require AC. That's another transformer you're going to need. But the uh, the Uno power supply, the cert suppression, and the UPS are all DC. Okay. And what's nice is their limited lifetime warranty doesn't require a certain level of their power supplies. Now they go Uno. Those trees. Is it, no, there's, I know trio. It's trio. Trio is the one I have on ours here. Yeah. There was another one in between, um, but there was three duo. different levels. What's that? Duo, I think. Yeah, Duo. That's it. So it's Uno, Duo, and then the uh, the Trio uh, power supply. So you don't need the most expensive power supply to meet that limited lifetime warranty. It just has to be one of their power supplies. So I guess with that, um, if there aren't any more questions, um, we'll be making this slide available as a PDF up on BP Tech Center. We'll also have the, um, so one the other, recording of this as well. One other thing, um, with the I.O. modules, if you're using this thing as a controller, we're going to be using the standard kit control blocks that we're used yep. to. Does yep. Phoenix have in store uh, an environment with which that they're making modules, like function modules. Uh, you mean if they're own, oriented, their own a, a Exactly, palette. a palette, palette of tools that's not on the no, table. Point, no. 
So it would be standard kit control. Right. Right. Which is stuff that we're already used to working with. You don't need anything specific, you know, anything new to learn to, to utilize. All right. So with that, then we'll go ahead and I'm just going to stop the recording of that.